Hello, The Way family. I miss you guys so much. I'm so glad to be with you today. And uh, even if it's digitally, I realized for me what was on my heart wasn't necessarily sharing something new, but I guess sort of a summary paragraph. I felt really led to actually go back to the scripture that is the first one I preached when I came to The Way out, out of uh, Luke 1. And I know over the course of the last couple of years, I've talked about Mary and Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth because they've really become my life scripture. And I just wanted to now take what I realize now is a kind of a complete thought of the last two years, how I came in holding this scripture and how as I'm leaving, I'm you have changed me and taught me new ways to think about it. So uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about in the scriptures I'm referencing will feel familiar. And I hope that uh, you'll um, give me that grace of being a little bit repetitive. I'm sort of been reflecting on this as a summary paragraph of some of my theological formation of my time at The Way. And so that's the journey I wanted to take with you today. Luke opens with this elderly couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who have been wanting a child for a long time. And for uh, the Jewish people, this would uh, stir a lot of memories because couples that are longing to have children is a really big part of their history and story. And so they'd be like, yes, this is us. We're a country that's waiting for a Messiah. This is a couple that's waiting for a child. Like this makes sense that this is how Luke is starting. And then we go, you know, we're in Jerusalem and we're in the temple. We're with Zechariah as he's serving as a priest. So this would make a lot of sense to the Jewish people. Like, yes, God's going to do something new and this is where it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I like to picture it like a movie, right? Like visualize it. So um, Zechariah is this older man. And it's helpful to know that this would have been a really significant day for Zechariah. You don't go in deeper into the temple every day to light the incense. There were 8,000 priests serving in Israel at that time. And they were divided into 24 different divisions. And they each had, each division had 300 priests. And the Abijah division that Zechariah was in would serve for two weeks out of the year. Every day, 50 56 priests would serve at the temple and those 56 priests during the two services would draw lots and if you drew you know the lot you got to go deeper into the temple and uh, light incense and the incense the smoke would go up and, and the people of Israel would stand outside and they would pray and the incense was a symbol of their prayers rising up to God and when you drew the lot after that you uh, did not get to do it again. So when Zechariah goes in to light the incense, it's like the pinnacle of his career. So you can feel like the music is keying up, like the intensity in the movie, like something's about to happen. And right then as he's lighting the incense, an angel appears and you can feel like if this is the movie, you're like, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. It's about to be on. And this angel says to Zechariah, this prayer, this longing of your heart, it's been heard by God and... Your prayer is going to be answered. You're going to have a child. And Zechariah is like, oh, no, actually, I don't think so. You probably don't realize that me and my wife are really old. And that's like we're kind of past that time of our lives. And what I love about this section is that this angel starts to trash talk uh, uh, Zechariah about who he is. He goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You must not know who I am. My name is Gabriel. Oh, you must not know where I came from. I recently came from the presence of the Lord. And you are going to have a child. But because you're talking nonsense, your mouth will stop talking. And no more words are going to come out of your mouth until this child is born. And that's where you can feel like all the music stops. And the needle goes off the record. And you just feel like, oh, I'm sorry. Is this what we were waiting for? Is this what we've been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? For an angel to show up and tell Zechariah it's on and Zechariah to get it wrong. <laughs> and then you have to picture the camera panning back. You have to picture the camera panning back from the temple and then panning back from Jerusalem and then panning back to that first city outside of Jerusalem and then to that next tinier suburb outside of Jerusalem that nobody knows. Of. And then like that tiny little town where like you get a burger before you really hit the five for the long road trip down to L.A. And then that town that you're like, does anybody live there? And that's Nazareth. So then we come up 
on Mary. And Mary, in contrast to the temple and in contrast to a priest at the pinnacle of his priestly career and in contrast to many Israelites praying and in contrast to being in Jerusalem, in contrast to being in the center of religious life, we are somewhere obscure, this tiny pit stop, and we have this no-name peasant girl, most likely illiterate, destined to be married, have many children, maybe lose some of them in childbirth or uh, lose them young, live and die anonymously. And that's Mary's destiny, just like basically every other young girl at that time. And the angel appears to her and says, you have been chosen to partner with the living God in one of the most intimate ways that you can. And she has questions too about how that will happen, but her questions don't upset Gabriel in the same way that Zechariah's questions did. And so uh, the angel explains um, that she'll be able to have a child even though she's a virgin because the Holy Spirit will hover over her. And she says, okay, let it be to me according to your word. And the other thing that is given to her is the gift of community. Because then Gabriel says, your cousin is also having a kind of weird pregnancy experience. And Mary knows right away that's who she needs to go to and be with. Luke opening in this way, this framework of the people that you think are going to lead the way, the people with education, the people with position, um, is where I came in. It's part of what I left my former role, I left being in white evangelical spaces because I knew I needed to have a Zechariah season, a silencing of the voice that I had heard from a lot. Um, I was in a deconstructing phase. I was thinking about, um, instead of being formed by white, straight men, my theological formation and my spiritual formation, I needed to listen to the Marys of the world. And so I didn't wanna just uh, focus on what I wasn't going to listen to, which is the Zechariah season. And I think we all need to lean into that though. Like who are the voices that have toxically shaped you, even if they had good intention, but they're no longer the voices that you listen to so that this new thing that God is happening can be birthed. Is it these patriarchal voices? Is it this male centered leadership? Is it this heteronormative uh, leadership that says, um, yeah, you can be queer, but could you like dial down the queerness? Um, don't make anybody uncomfortable with your queerness. Is Are those the voices that we need to stop listening to? To women who we're still waiting sometimes for permission to fully be ourselves and fully lead. Um, to those who don't have like a formal degree and feel like uh, you're not legitimate without that, but you know the Holy Spirit has given you something that you're supposed to steward. What are the traditional voices that we need to stop listening to? That's really was how I came into the way. And what I'm so grateful for was I got to learn so much about a tradition utterly unconnected to the one that had been so painful for me. And so coming in here and as Pastor Mike says, uh, learning from the Black Holiness Pentecostal tradition, learning about loving and engaging with social justice um, from a Black liberation perspective has been um a season of Mary for me, a season of listening to a new voice and centering a new voice. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So after the angel leaves Mary, Mary rushes off to see her cousin. And what I would say is, as I stayed at the way, my focus shifted from deconstructing, uh, like who do I need to stop listening to and being formed? Uh, and it shifted to this radical community that is being shaped by Elizabeth and Mary. I just love this. It says in Luke 139, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, 
Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of the greeting, of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. I love this picture so, so, so much. I love this picture because if you think about it, when we met Elizabeth at the beginning of Luke, she's just like an elderly woman who wanted a child but didn't have it. Now we have this older, pregnant woman who's in this house that's very quiet because her husband has been silenced and just loudly yelling what she sees the Holy Spirit doing in Mary. And I just love this because one, I think still to this day, women, women of color, black women are told to tamp down, to be quiet. That if these people, you know, like, oh, you know, uh, like Elizabeth, maybe like your ministry should be on hold because like your husband's ministry is struggling. And there's just none of that. She is loud, declarative, and the work of the Holy Spirit in her lets her see what the Holy Spirit is doing in this other young woman. And it is radical and revolutionary and filled with love and affirmation. And she is theologizing. She's interpreting what she's seeing happening around her, not in the temple, not in Jerusalem, but in a house, in a space that is usually dismissed and relegated to where women stay to do their woman stuff. And God has said, this is where radical community will happen. This is where theologizing will happen. This is where the new Thing happens. And it's not anymore just about the voice that you're not going to listen to. It's about these new voices that are creating this new and radical community. It's why I'm so delighted that um, there's been this panel today of brothers and sisters, uh, our queer family sharing, because that is a voice that we need to be listening to, amplifying, following their leadership. It is some of the new radical community um, that we as followers of, as, of Jesus are imagining in to. And so um, Elizabeth greets Mary. And what I love about this is when Mary has this experience of being seen by Elizabeth, it, it's after that that she's able to interpret what she does, interpret what she has experienced, interpret what's happening in her body, and give us the Magnificat which is this amazing, radical piece of theology. So I didn't know this about the Magnificat, right? But this is this amazing theological reflection that Jesus goes on to reference both in Luke 4 in his inaugural address and later in the Sermon on the Plain. But when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, uh, he has brought down the powerful. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. People try to just diminish what she's doing as if it's not theological work. But when the British uh, were ruling India, did you know that her words were prohibited from being sung in church? They were not allowed because people because the colonizing power understood how radical it was they understood that it was political they understood that it was about justice and liberation and so even though people have tried to like be like well that's just neat pregnant lady journal poetry people in power know it for exactly what it is in the 80s in guatemala uh you know, there was an a group of incredibly impoverished folks who were coming together for revolution and they discovered Mary's words and it was empowering them and mobilizing them. And because of that, the Guatemalan government actually banned any public recitation of Mary's words. Similarly, uh, in Argentina, during the Dirty War, um, people were printing pictures of Mary's radical, liberative theology on posters all over the capital. And they, um, the military junta of Argentina, they outlawed any displays of it. So what I see happening here is, and the 
uh, arc for me in my journey with you all at the way was I came in and I was like, I got to silence some voices and stop listening to them. And I, I need to move into uh, listening to Mary. But as I've stayed, it's become less about the voices I'm not listening to and then seeing what is the radical community that we should be leaning into and creating. And so now on the tail end of my time at The Way, I began not just to see, be blessed by the radical community that is The Way, but continue now to imagine even uh, deeper, wider, expansive, liberative dreams. Where I, What I'm thinking about and what I just can't get over is this idea of the place of our imaginations in social justice and this idea that all social justice is science fiction. Um, you know, this comes from, you know, Octavia Butler comes from uh, Afrofuturism, comes from um, uh, folks like Octavia's Brutes. I really want to credit Black women thinkers who have exposed me to this. Um, but the idea that social justice isn't reaching back for anything, but it's imagining a world that we've never seen. And so just like Mary and Elizabeth are creating a new kind of community and a new theologizing community that we've never seen, that they, we have never seen before. I think as we are in this season of uprising and disruption, it is about, um, what is energizing me is, uh, what is the, the big dream? So Octavia's Brood, on their website, they have this thing that says, the idea of visionary fiction allows us to move from asking the question, what is a realistic win, which is one that organizers ask, to what is the world we want to live in? And I just have been thinking about that because I don't just dream of justice for Ahmaud Arbery, though I do. And I don't just dream of justice for George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Rhea Milton or Dominique Feltz. Dominique Fells, it's not enough that the police officers are arrested or that they go to trial or that they are found guilty. Yes, I want that to happen, but I have dreams, dreams of a world where the end of anti-Black violence, that where there's generations of people who don't even know what white supremacy is, what anti-Blackness is. I have spent more time recently just letting my imagination energize me because it is grueling and there is a lot that is so discouraging and traumatizing. But I do spend time thinking about what is a world like what would a world without prisons be like? I know I'm following the leadership, obviously, of those who have been dreaming these dreams for a long time. What would a world without guns be like? Not just a world with fewer guns, not just like guns that shoot less than a hundred bullets a second, but just a world where there are no mini murder machines. Like, let's just imagine it. I imagine a world, I, when I talk about women or women identifying folks, can you imagine a world where you put on whatever you wanna wear and you walk out of your house at whatever time of day you want to walk out. You can go wherever you want without being hyper-conscious of your context or fearing for your safety. Everyone I know says you can't imagine that world. But let's imagine it for a moment. Because what we want to build, this radical community, requires an imagination that is deep and wide and broad. So that when we're laboring away in the everyday practicals, we have that to hold on to. That we together collectively have a liberative dream and imagination. And one of the things I've been thinking about uh, is that the dreams we follow, it's not just individual dreams, right? Because we live in an individualistic culture. So it can be easy sometimes to be like, oh yeah, what's my dream? What's the dream I'm going to do? Liberation doesn't come through just individualistic effort, right? We may have our individual place in that, but it is a collective dream that has to be labored for collectively. And the dreams we have to have are the dreams of those most on the margins, right? So when I'm talking to white folks, I'm like, well, we're not going to follow the dreams of white men because even when white men dream about the future, they're still in charge and the people of color are like decorative if 
if we're even there and women are still just like emotional side pieces um, that motivate their great epic journey. We, it's not about the dreams of those in power and it's not even just about our individualistic dreams, but it is the collective dream following the lead of those most impacted by unjust systems. So I love that right now there is the, you know, black folks most impacted by uh, police violence and uh, mass incarceration, the dream of uh, police abolishing the police and uh, prison abolition is getting to be heard. I wanna listen to the dreams of indigenous disability justice advocates, because even when I dream dreams, I dream able-bodied dreams. When I, I wanna dream dreams that are led to, uh, given to us by our uh, trans black women, because when I dream dreams, I still dream cis hetero dreams. And so I want us to collectively listen to the dreams of liberation and justice that come from the most marginalized. So Afrofuturism uh, has been helping me do that and also uh, indigenous futurism. And so there's this beautiful quote that I wanted to share with you. It says, indigenous futurism allows for everyday indigenous peoples to restore their beings, bodies, genders, sexualities, and reproductive lives from colonial institutions, projecting decolonial love and kinship into the cosmos. I am obsessed with this quote. Let me just, indigenous futurism allows for everyday indigenous peoples to restore their beings, bodies, genders, sexualities, and reproductive lives from colonial institutions, projecting decolonial love and kinship into the cosmos. As I imagine a liberated future, I follow this idea of projecting, spreading, sharing, decolonial love and kinship. To me, that is another way of talking about the Holy Spirit, just which is just and liberative and isn't colonial, but is this, I think the Holy Spirit is so much connected to our imaginations. And I know that you've been in this season of little fires everywhere and that this idea of uh, expansive decolonial love. I just love it. And it's a part of my dream of the radical community that we're leaning into and living into. So as, I'm, as I have been closing my time at the way, I have been leaning deeply into imagination, into creating these radical communities, into listening to the dreams of those most on the margins. And I think I have been deeply sitting with how can we, even in our social justice practice, continue to uh, make sure that we have liberated, decolonized um, uh, methods of leaning into social justice that aren't beholden to patriarchy, that aren't beholden to heteronormativity, that aren't beholden to these patterns, um, I think, of workaholism, of martyring ourselves on, for the sake of the cause, um, that we have to pursue justice now in ways that embody the values of the community we want to see come into existence. That it can't be something that we will manifest later if we're not living into it now, particularly for women of color. And I've said this many times and I feel like I just have to say, it's what I want to close with is for women and particularly the amazing, amazing black women who have welcomed me into their lives and stories at the way. I never question if you will show up with all your hearts to do the heavy lifting. You always do. But I really imagine a space where right now is a time to live into your mental health, your emotional well-being, your physical well-being, where you don't have to expend yourself to a level that is exhausting and beyond your healthy limits because you've been told you have to. Your joy and your wholeness and your wellness is for later and you have to martyr yourself for the cause. What I want to say is the liberative dream that I am carrying with me is that we can pursue those beautiful practices now. How Mary and Elizabeth create beautiful, healthy, loving, affirming community with and for each other. 
And so I hope, beautiful family of the way, that as we continue to work together for our shared liberation, that will be done in a way that holds so much room for joy and pleasure, community and affirmation, healthiness right now. I love you. I am so deeply honored to have journeyed with you these last couple of years. So deeply grateful for all the ways you invited me into your lives and your stories. And I wanted to end. I know many of the things I talked about today, you've heard me talk about before, but this is my journey in a complete thought. So thank you. I love you guys.